Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. Let it go, let it go. That's right, my next guest, Mr. Tim Davies. Let it go for sure, working on Frozen both one and two as an arranger, orchestrator, and conductor, in addition to Hotel Transylvania 3, Empire, La La Land, The Lego Movie 2, and Minions, just to name a few films. But also, let's talk about video games, Marvel Spider-Man, Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare, God of War, Infamous... All right, the list really goes on. Now, Tim and I had the pleasure of working together when we did the Baby face performance with the National Symphony Orchestra at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Additionally, he's done that show with Nas, Kendrick Lamar, Lettucey, Common, and Maxwell, also at the Kennedy Center. Take a listen to this episode of the Career Musician Podcast with the amazing Tim Davies as he goes into detail about what it's like to be on the biggest Hollywood scoring stages. Welcome to the Career Musician Podcast, Mr. Tim Davies. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Good to see you. You're looking quite debonair today. Do you have another session or a meeting after this? Well, it's not every day I go to the Valley, you know, I have to dress up. (laughs) I mean, I haven't been here for like 12 hours. I was here last night at Warner Brothers. Oh, okay. (laughs) I was supposed to be there tonight, but I'm just going to play hooky. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Playing hooky from work. Well, I'm I'm actually playing hooky from Fox already Mm. to go and see Sting in Last Ship tonight. Wow. And um, then we were recording at Water Brothers last night. We didn't get done. So there's another session for the same project tonight that they pushed my piece that I was working on onto, but I couldn't. So I'm playing hooky twice tonight. Wow. Wow. Are you at liberty to say which project that is or not at the moment? Uh, no, I think I can. It's uh, uh, Animaniacs. It's, and, right. it's oh, announced. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm just working on, I'm just helping out with some orchestrating on some songs. We're super excited about that. My daughter and I, who you just met, Nina, yeah. she's a huge Animaniacs fan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I remember the original, and it's, right. they've got pretty much the same crew back together. Of course, I wasn't on it the first time. But, right, uh, right. That was a while I just got to, you know, like I get, occasionally you get these last minute calls when they just need help. Yeah. And I uh, got a call just three days ago to orchestrate this song and work with the songwriters. So it was nice. kind of cool. Did it and then um, yeah, we we got halfway through and then ran out of time. So oh wow! Yeah. So tell us about that. What's it like when you're in a, a scoring stage and you run out of time? Why was it? Were you on a strict time well, constraint? Yeah, budgetary? I mean, yeah. If we only had one session, then they probably would have gone into overtime to do it. But we they have another one for the same project tonight. Okay. So they just you know we tried to get as much as we could. It was a right. uh, you know in animation. You know, it's a lot of tricky tempos. So mm-hmm. this song, you know, it's a really cool song, but it changes tempos all the time. So we have to record it in lots of little sections. So mm-hmm. you can't just go from the beginning to the end. I mean, we, we cheat a lot in film music, recording stops and starts. Right. Um, and animation, you know, in particular, you know, is, is kind of tricky because you've also got to like Mickey Mouse things and hit lots of little things. So the tempos are going all over the place to, to do that. Mm. Um, so anyway, yeah, we uh, got about halfway. And that was like three chunks and then there'll be probably another two or three chunks to get it to the end put back together. You won't know. 
Right. Of course. You never know. No. Fix it in post, as they say, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, in order to prevent going into overtime and having to pay all of the overtime salaries on the card, the union card, yeah. they just booked another session. Said we'll just do. They it. already had it booked. They had it booked. Yeah. Anyway. We were, so it was perfect. It, it worked out fine. Makes it's just sense. I'm not available right. to go to go tonight. I mean, I, right. I have been on situations where we have gone into overtime mm-hmm. when it's been the last day, or you know, I mean, quite often they'll build it into the budgets anyway. Right. You have uh, on union sessions, you have an hour hold, so no one is allowed to leave. So you can hold everyone for up to an hour. Uh, After that, they can say they've got another gig to go to. But on any session, if it's a single or if it's a double, it's just at the end of the day, right. everyone has to stay. So um, when we were doing Lego 2 last year, the uh, there was like just two cues that just you know couldn't get a consensus from the two producers and the director. Mm. And so we kept trying little versions and they were all in the next building, but we would record it with an orchestra. They would do a quick mix, bounce it to a quick time, send it to the next building and wait wow. for them to take a break in dubbing to listen to it. So we sat there for two hours doing this. Wow. And in the end we gave up because we just couldn't, they, they were too busy. It was not anyone's fault. It's right. just, you know, when these movies at the last minute and everyone's going crazy. Everybody's running around. Trying and, to and, but, but, you know, when you get into that, uh, Eighth hour is when everyone hits, you know, double time. Mm. The, the first extra hour is just prorated and then you get into the, the extra. So that was getting quite expensive to have 75 people standing That's around. Right. Wow. So they just booked another session once they had it all dialed in sure. and everyone could relax and breathe and work out what it was. Sure. Well, we jumped right in because it's fascinating. Yeah, sorry. And no, no, no. I, I, I want the listeners to really understand what it takes, what goes into doing film and TV music with, with a proper proper orchestra and for the big studios right here actually around the corner from my little shack of a studio <laughs> but it's cozy uh so tell us let's rewind mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about you so you started as a drummer yes and then you kind of laterally shifted into orchestrating and arranging correct well i was always interested in the writing side and arranging and um putting together bands and sort of being the leader kind of vibe. Right. But the first thing I played was drums and then I did some saxophone. I uh, wasn't very good. And I always doodled on piano and guitar and whatever mm-hmm. instruments were around the house, trumpets and French horns and all that sort of stuff. Cause that's what my brothers and sister played. Okay. So you have some woodwind brass. Yeah. 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 And that's really helped in my career as an orchestrator. I, Absolutely. Mean, I wasn't very good, but at least I've played it. You know, I've sat in a band and I've sat in an orchestra and I've played mm. percussion at the back of an orchestra, which helps when you're standing out front, having right. been on the other side. Um, so you anyways, have all of these perspectives from each yeah, section. Yeah, and I think it's really important to have done to have done that. Absolutely. Uh, but I just was always interested in the nuts and bolts of music mm. and theory and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I started putting together bands and arranging. And, you know, my first band was like a year nine trio and no one, I couldn't find anyone to actually play piano properly because we didn't have a bass player. So someone had to play left hand bass mm. and actually just find a chord chart and make stuff up. And I could do that. So I ended up playing piano actually. And, you know, another friend played saxophone, another friend played drums. So I could actually play all the instruments, but uh, I was the pianist in my first band. But That's that was awesome. the, that was the peak of my piano playing chops. Okay. And what kind of stuff were you guys doing? Just, oh, we would play like pop songs and you okay. know, we'd play Careless Whisper and, you know. Oh, nice, nice. Right, Yellow Brick Road and um, some Billy Joel. Hey, but the, that's still the some Stranger good... and Moving Out and all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh, man, that's still, still some good piano chops. Well, there, that, was, that was the peak, though. That's that what I'm the saying. Peak. Okay. That was the peak of my <laughs> okay. piano playing. It's, I have not, you know, I'm terrible now. Right. You know? right. And, and I can imagine things and thanks to computers, I can program things. And of course. Have anything played. But I'm, my brain was always into working things out and I could, you know, imagine things. And now it's all imagination and then the computer realizes it. But so back then I was doing that and uh, then I went to um, uh, the conservatorium. You know, I started as a percussion major, but I was always arranging and putting together bands and orchestras. I mean, I was the kid that put together his own orchestra, did a concert. You know, they, cool I couldn't that? get in front of the, the actual orchestra because, you know, they wouldn't let me. Right. So I just thought, okay, well, I'll just put together my own. Wow. So I did that and uh, I started. My first arranging was actually for the percussion ensemble because we had a unique group and you couldn't buy repertoire. So while everyone else was doing arrangements of, you know, 
Mozart 40 and uh, some Bach and, and all that sort of stuff. I went and did um, Elton John funeral for a friend, which was kind of like a shock to everyone because we wow. they hadn't done that. And uh, But that sort of got me started into arranging. Then I did Bohemian Rhapsody and... And these were also, these started my, my sort of oral skills because I had to transcribe it. That's you know, right. Because you couldn't just go on the internet and find the sheet and music. Find the, the but even, even yeah. these days when you go on and find the sheet music, it's mm. wrong. Exactly. So you, it's usually worse. So, and, and it's great training to do it yourself. Yeah, so I did. So I, I mean, teacher. so yeah. now I've got the luxury of hiring people to do sure. that sort of stuff. Um, I've worked with I, a few of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. we do those projects, right, yeah. Right. And, uh, but I did start doing, you know, everything myself, but I was doing that. And, and the cool part of it was, uh, the university had a recording technology program and I became their sort of pet composer and arranger. So they mm. would invite me in to do projects and, and all that. And I did actually end up changing majors to composition after a little while, cause I was spending more time writing than playing. And I was never cut out to be a marimba soloist or play triangle at the back of an orchestra. <laughs> You know, I had much more fun out the front. I was going to say, but your talents are so vast. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, I, I have this brain work. for problem solving and working out these sorts of puzzles. So mm, that's awesome. That's that's what I ended up doing. But I was doing pretty much extracurricular back at the Queensland Conservatorium. I was doing all of the things that I actually do now for my job. Mm. You know, but and that one and this was before you did courses in film scoring and and media music and all of that. So, you know, you had to do it on your own. I love it. You're already projecting into the future, not even really being aware of it. I didn't know I was doing it. Of course, but but intrinsically it's in you. Yeah, it was a complete accident, sort of fairly accidental that I ended up in LA, you know. Wow. You know, I, I ticked a box one day. I knew I had to leave Australia and study because that's what, you know, everyone who I looked up to had done. They'd all gone and studied mostly in Europe, but some in America. And uh, my teacher at the time gave me the brochure for USC film scoring and said, you should consider doing this. And I'm like, Mm. oh, okay. So I, and then there was a grant um, coming up and I put down for it and I said, oh, I'll go and get, do this program. And I got the money. So then I had to get into the program because otherwise it was going to be useless um, and I did, so I got in and so I don't, you know, I didn't really have an interest in being a film composer and I still don't, you know, I'm an arranger and I do all this other stuff, but I, I thought it'd be fun to do. And I had, you know, some money towards it. Right. So I came over and, you know, did the program and, um, you know, I didn't really like it. I, I'm not. You know, yeah, it's just there was a lot of other people in the in the program that were way into film scoring and that's what they'd always wanted to do and they'd chop limbs off to be film composers. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not me. I'm a musician. So, so hold on, hold on, because yeah. you're saying some great stuff here. First oh. of all, I was going to bring us back. Thank you for the for the intersection here. You're from Australia. Yeah. And then this teacher recognized that talent in you and said, hey, why don't you check out the, the USC uh, film school? Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I have a knack for writing tunes and... Right. And... You know, in the academic world, most people, and back then too, you know, it was usually art music that people wrote, Mm -hmm. you know, crazy out there Mm -hmm. stuff. And I was always writing sort of more accessible, you know, pretty stuff, whatever. whatever Similar to what you were doing with your bands all throughout. You know, I mean, I was sort of the jazz was a separate thing, but, you know, my, he, yeah, he saw that I could fit in in that world. Mm -hmm. My, you know, Heart was not in film scoring. I wasn't like someone that had decided when they were five and heard Star Wars that they yeah, were going to be that. That's not me, you know. Right. But so, so you get this grant then, which yeah. uh, again, I, I love your initiative. You, you you go, you apply, you get the grant. Now you have to audition to get in. You get in. Mm-hmm. And now you discover, is this when you discover that you're more of an arranger, orchestrator in, no. instead of composer? Or how did you No, that was already to... what I was doing. Okay. I was already doing things and I'd already put together my first big band in Australia and had a bit of success right. doing that. So, Saw that on your website. So, it cool. all, you know, it was where I was going, but in Australia, you know, you, it's hard to just do that and make a living okay. because it's small and the budgets aren't as big. So mm. I had a lecturing job at a university. I had a 0.6, so I did, you know, three days there and then arranged and taught and did other things for two days. Okay, what's a point six? Uh, three days a week. So instead okay. of a full, would be a, a, a one. I got you, know, you. 
Okay. So it's 0.2 per day kind of thing. That's, right, that's right, right. as good as my maths gets. Okay. Um, <laughs> Better so, than mine. <laughs> so, uh, well, you guys can't even put an S on it. So. <laughs> but um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I was already doing that stuff. Yeah. But then when I got to LA and I did the program and I still, you know, nothing really super resonated with me about wanting to be a film composer, but mm. I was like, oh, this orchestration and conducting thing, right. that's me. And the reason why I asked, because it's not every day that a musician says, hmm, this orchestrating arranging thing is really... So that's what, it's what it's, it seems a little peculiar and quite fascinating, you know, so... Yeah, uh, and, but that was, that was me, you know. It was I just was, in you, yes. Yeah, I don't uh, think, you know, everyone that can write a pretty tune necessarily has to be a film composer or to, wants right. to be a film composer you know that's great um i just like playing with dots that's and, awesome. and like i mentioned earlier like to me it's all about solving this puzzle no matter what it is whether mm. i'm composing and you know having to please the director and you know do something for the scene or whether i'm orchestrating for someone else mm. and they've done their bit and then i've got to solve the puzzle of maybe something impossible that they wrote in their computer and i've got to translate that to a live orchestra or whether it's arranging, you know, and there's some crazy tune and I'm just like, what am I going to do with this? You know, I've got to add an orchestra wow. to this to this piece. Expound on that. So you get you get a tune that you have to arrange. Yeah, so what, tell us what the first step is, what that's like. Well, like, you know, for example, when we did, uh, did uh, Baby, Baby Face. Face with the... Lincoln Center. Yeah, yeah I, uh, Kennedy Center. Kennedy Center, sorry. Whoop, 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 Watch whoop, my centers. Edit, edit that, right? You know, plug in. It'll nah, fix no that. edits. Yeah. But, uh, no, so I do a lot of these shows at yeah. uh, at the Kennedy Center. Right. Uh, it's been a great gig. I mean, it started with, we did Nas and then Kendrick Lamar and we've done Common. The last one we did was Maxwell. And in the middle of all that, we did, we did Kenny, which is when we met. Right. And... Um, you know, so we actually, that was a great one because we worked perfect. on the set list and we worked out what we wanted to do right. and we wanted to cover this and yeah. we got to balance it with, you know, ones where it was going to be loud and rocking out and then quite more intimate stuff to feature the orchestra and all right. of that. And by the way, folks, if you have to check it out, uh, uh, Kenny Babyface Edmonds at the Kennedy Center with Tim Davies arranging, conducting incredible the There's work you did a couple of links on yeah, absolutely you find, yeah. and i'll put i'll attach them to this yeah. episode but beautiful stuff by the yeah. way yeah so you know i mean my my the the funniest part of or the most my most fun part of that gig was uh and and like solving a puzzle so i was in the shower and you know kenny wanted to do fire and rain yeah and i had in my head i just went firebird and rain. That's right. I remember you tell. That's right. <laughs> and and you know. Yeah. So you made an amalgam of the if two. If you want to make that's something right. happen, you have to tell everyone you're going to do it, even though you don't know how to do it. So I, I told mm -hmm. all these people, I'm going to do a mashup of that's Stravinsky's right. Firebird and Fire and Rain. For, I remember that. for Babyface. That's right. And I'm just like working it out, and you know, it it actually worked really well it was beautiful you know it was because, amazing you know it's uh, the the la 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 is like a pentatonic kind of thing right. and that's going to fit over anything and it falls right into it falls right in i used pop it as song the introduction like of yeah. the french horn and then that became the little link and then the interlude and then you know you guys had the really big ending already right and i didn't put the firebird ending on and then then jeremy levy who's you know my right hand man on all these projects right he was proofreading it and he's like, oh, come on. You've got Just to put the ending on. Bring it you, back. You yeah. can't, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we put the, the big Firebird <laughs> ending on. So I really did have my mashup of uh, Firebird and Rain. It so was that was awesome. like a, prob a problem I created for myself that I had to solve. Right. So what I love that because the, the idea comes to you and then you have to figure it out. All right. So you, first of all, the fact that you worked with all of these um, rappers and soul musicians and you're or adding this orchestrations that's incredible because again it's like the juxtaposition of you know two uh, polar opposite worlds one would think right yeah you get these you get the set lists you yep. start listening to the song mm -hmm. what's your first step in saying okay i'm going to arrange now let's say take nas or take any one of yeah. the Kendrick well I, I get the song and i start to listen to it you know write it down Okay. You know, sometimes I do it myself. Other times I'll have someone else do it, you know, because we'll have multiple projects. So you'll going sketch out the actual song. The actual yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. You know, start with the the song I like to get, you know, a live version and then the studio version as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. you find little bits of great 
information. Sometimes you can hear things better in the studio version. Right. But then there's also a lot of artists, they change it and develop it as they go along and play it and you guys come into the band and all of a sudden that line's got a different note in it. Yeah. And so then you have to ask, uh, will that sax player be playing the gig that plays the wrong note? You know, Mm. Um, I didn't mean to use that as an example of anyone in particular (laughs) to say, but that happens all the time. You do find discrepancies in people's own music from the the studio version to the live version. The live versions have more energy. People, Yeah, people have gone off and they've put in new sections and had ideas and jam on and all that. So I need to kind of bridge the gap, you know, because there's bits that people will want from the original and then there's, you know, there's the cool bits. And then there's the bits that I can add. Mm. So we're really lucky when we do the Kennedy Center shows. They're really wanting us to do something unique and collaborative. Mm. You know, they don't want us just to add a string section to the band. Right. They right. want something unique. So the Fire and Rain thing was like a perfect thing for that environment. That's sure. never going to happen anywhere else. Right. Know? Absolutely. Um, that someone would be that stupid to come up with the no, idea. No, no, on the contrary. <laughs> what a great opportunity. But, but, but that also you that, that we were given that opportunity that mm-hmm. we, you know, we have this. I mean, I still pinch myself that, you know, I get an orchestra. I mean, I mm-hmm. used to have to, you know, you just wanted to do that. And then back in college, I begged my friends to play for me so I could do it. And now I get, get paid to, to do it and I, and I and trusted to do it, you know. Incredible. When Justin Ellis from Kennedy Center calls me and says, hey, we're doing you know, so-and-so right. go for it. And they trust me to just show up with an hour and a half worth of charts. It's awesome. It's, it and, is, and it's a great team, by the way, that whole team over at the Kennedy center and your team. Well, everywhere Jeremy, has to have everybody. a great team because not one person can do anything. So, and I've worked with them for like six years now. Mm-hmm. Um, so they know what I'm going to do. You know, that, right. Well, they know to trust me with what I'm going to do. And, uh, I know what they need to know and what they don't need to know. Mm. And, and it's just, it's a great relationship. So, and we, we tend to do like one big project like that, you know, cool, artistic, new kind of thing per year. Mm. And then, then, then there's the odd other one where it's more, might be a little bit more commercial, you know, mm. where, where, where someone's going to sing something well-known um, and we, we want to make it comfortable and keep it well-known. Right. But, you know, on those shows, and I always try to balance it too, you know, you don't want to put the artist in a position where the entire show is going to be thinking too much. Mm. You don't want to put them in that position. You still want to make it easy for them. So, you know, like on, on when we did it with Kenny, we had a couple of them where he, he really had to think. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then, you know, a bunch where it was just he could go on autopilot and, and you guys did your thing. And I, I, the orchestra, I fit in the gaps, you That's know, right. and all, yeah. all over it. Um, we did the same thing with Maxwell. You know, we uh, had some where it was completely new versions. Mm. Um, and then others where, you know, we sort of played along to the band, mm-hmm. you know, and provided you balance it all, then, then no one knows. The, you know, you know what was really interesting. We didn't have a lot of rehearsal. I think that's so cool. No. Um, the fact that, well, you know, when I was in his band, we didn't rehearse. Our sound mm-hmm. checks were like little quick mini rehearsals. Um, but the band itself rehearsed here in Los Angeles a couple times. Uh, please help yourself. Whatever you want. I was trying to work out yeah. if they're olives or chocolate these, coated. Um, these are macadamias. chocolate uh, almonds. Chocolate covered. That's almonds. good. That's good because <laughs> you know delish. if I put that in my mouth and it was an olive. This microphone would need a cover twice as big. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I'm going uh, yeah, in. Please I'm going in. Chomp away. Go oh, in. you lied me, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens when you provide a for mm-hmm. your guests. <laughs> so uh, what was I saying? So we were in L.A. rehearsing. We mm-hmm. did a couple days, I think. Maybe. No, I think we only brought no, you in for just, one day. Yeah, I just dropped by to say you hello. You dropped by. We were doing rehearsals for something else. Mm-hmm. You came in for no, that. That was funny. That was the day, day. that... um. Remember you had the, uh, you were what trying to line some tracks up yes. and, and we called Jordan in to come and help. Right. And then he showed up and Jordan's one of the guys that works with me. He's another one arranger tech, and yeah, he's a great yeah. jazz pianist. Yeah. And, uh, but he knows digital performer really well. That was the thing, That's right? what it we was. We needed an expert in digital performer. Yeah. That's right. So he shows up. And then uh, the keyboard player calls yeah. in sick. Like he oh, had some like 24 hour right. bug. Oh. And so Jordan oh my gosh. jumped up and played he the rehearsal. In. That's yeah. right. That's right. I remember. <laughs> and then Jeremy was there too, helping with the orchestrations to, ma- to, yeah. to make sure the arrangements were Yeah, well, all we had, on point. you know, it's yeah. the whole team. The you whole, know, yeah, but absolutely. Was, yeah. 
Well, that Jordan and Jeremy, one. those guys are great, man. Mm. You have a good team. You've assembled. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with them yeah. for a while. Jeremy, in particular, is like, uh, gosh, ten years now. I think. Oh wow. Oh, he's man. he's conducting tonight when I'm playing hooky, going off to the show. Very nice, man. Good for him. <laughs> it's his first time too. Really. Conduct, well, see, conducting. It'll be it'll be yeah, fun. Yeah, I want to get those guys on the podcast. Yeah, too. yeah they yeah, have some should. great stories, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. They're so, only allowed to tell good ones about me, though. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna say they'll, they'll mind their p's and q's. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so we did a quick little rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the the Kennedy Center, and we, I think we did a day, one, one day. We had uh, Jewel, those shows. It's normally pretty tight. You have like one rehearsal, right? Like three hours, but you have to take a. 15, 20 minute break. Yeah, so it's a half it, a day. Maybe it's two and a half. It's not a lot. No, it's a, uh, rough, and then, roughly a half. And then you have the next day, you have what they call the sound check, which the is another check. two and a half hour rehearsal. Right. And then the show. And that's and it. That was it. So, yeah. I mean, that's where the experience comes in. That's right. Uh, for me and my team. That's right. You know, being able, I mean, it's one thing to have a great idea, but you got to mm -hmm. pull it off. You got to put it on the paper in a way that all those classical musicians make it translatable. It can that's play it. Right. And, then, and that's what I've learned from, you know, orchestrating thousands of pieces of music for movies is, mm. is putting things on the page in a way that tricks everyone into feeling and, and it's sounding like it's been played before. Right. right. When it hasn't, uh. you know, cause we don't rehearse, we That's record. Right. So right. if I'm, you know, doing things wrong or can't put the right information on the page, it's a balance, right? You don't want to put too much information, but you just got to know what's just right. That's right. Um, so, uh -huh. you know, that's my knack, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I can do that. And so it pays off in those situations when you have, you know, 75, 80 people on stage and the artist who doesn't want to waste time because you really got to spend time with, especially when you're doing unique new stuff, you have to spend time making the artist feel comfortable, not worrying about the orchestra, but you so, still have to, you know, when you're conducting those things, it's a, it's a balancing act of making sure that everyone's happy and everyone's feeling loved and wanted and, <laughs> and you know, it can be, well it said, can be a my tough friend. day. And then well if, said. And if there is mistakes, then you're screwed because you got to stop and fix the parts when the hands go up mm -hmm. from the orchestra. So, you know, luckily we don't have many of them. That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> but again, you just said it. But that's when practice. You started. It's, it's the experience. Yeah. It's just the, exactly. Absolutely. You said it. Experience. In one word, you can sum it up. So the same thing applies really when you're doing film or TV, mm -hmm. especially out here in Los Angeles. Like you said, you have all of these orchestras, all these players that this is what they do on a daily basis. They're in two or three sessions a day sometimes, mm -hmm. or at least several sessions a week. Mm. So let's talk about that okay. because the Kennedy Center is a performance, a live performance. Yep. Now we're talking about for film, it's going in, down on a recording. And now with these, you don't have a rehearsal per se. You're just going in, you're bringing in the charts. Expound on that a little bit. So, you know, I work on the orchestration with, with my crew, you know, because the timeline on these things is, you know, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller Crunch, because they keep they're... changing the movies. So you, ah. you can't, the composer can't finish it and send it off because the movie keeps changing. So we have to wait till the last minute wow. to, you know, because once it starts getting orchestrated, once you've pulled that trigger, it's harder to make the changes. That's right. Because it's more people have to make changes, and it's a lot of and money spent at that point. Right? Yeah, on a or? big movie, it's not a big deal, but okay. it's a time thing because that's a lot of paper, that's a lot of printing. You know, they can't mm -hmm. just wait on a massive movie to the day before to print all of that paper for the orchestra. So it has to start the week before. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we used to start four weeks before, maybe six. Now we're on a good one. We'll start three weeks before the session. Okay. But sometimes it's just two weeks. So, wow. you know, I can't do it all myself because I'm, there's not enough hours left in the day. Sure. So we split it all up, you know, with, with the crew. But anyway, so we will do the orchestrations. And if I do it, you know, Jeremy proofreads it. And if he does it, I proofread it. And we check it and we give each other notes and we get it all done. Uh, Ryan, who who's sort of on the team, he he sets everything up and then he'll check things and then he'll do some orchestrating as well. So, you know, mm. everyone can do everything and, and we all help each other out to, to get there at the end of the, at the session. Right. And so we show up, well, so we finish the orchestrations and it goes to the copyists and they make all the parts, make sure it's all pretty. And, you know, there's just ways right. that we copy parts in LA for studio to make it work you know, easy to sight read. They're laid out in a particular way mm. that you wouldn't do in the, in the concert world. You don't need to, you know, um, just for things like, for, for example, you know, we don't jam up all the rests because one, you might need to write some new music in 
So if you've gone and put 24 bars of rest on one line, it's really hard to find bar 13 of that and write in That's four notes. Right. It's impossible. So you're putting each bar. So of you rest might be still four. No, it's we still four at a time. They, so yeah, but just four. Maybe yeah. four at a time with sure. a little, you know, block in the middle. Yeah. And so there's plenty of room to write in. But also because we stop and start all the time, you don't want someone trying to find, you know, bar 17 of 20. Mm-hmm. So you split it up as well. So there's bar numbers everywhere. Right. I mean, there's just little things like that. Little so tricks, there is a real right. art to the copying. So, wow. you know, that goes off to the copyists and they do the parts and then they show up with all the printouts, the parts and then scores, excuse me, for me to conduct and right. the booth and, and everything. Because there's like a lot of people there. Of there's course. There's the music editor, there's the <laughs> engineer, the Pro Tools operator. Uh, there's a person on the stage who's running the click track, making sure the volumes are right. You know, there's there's probably like six to eight people that need scores. So many so, moving parts. It's a lot of paper, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, and so then we get there and, uh, you know, we call the queue or I, I call it, you know, we somehow decide which one we're going to do first. Mm-hmm. And and then we, we, we play it. And uh, if it's a like a low budget movie or TV, and you kind of get it right the first time, well, <laughs> there's no point to do it the second time, you right. know? <laughs> That's right? We might do a safety. But, you know, I've done movies where we just plow through it. You just know, it's, you've got take. a lot of people listening. So right. if there was a glitch or something, you know, someone would have heard it. Said something, right. And uh, But, you know, on a bigger movie. So, for example, you know, we just did Frozen 2 uh, last year. Right. And so we'll play it down. I will give my little two cents on what I think because I'm the first person. I'm the closest to it. I've, uh, I know the score. I know the nuts and bolts, the inner parts of the score. You know, Chris. We should mention though, but you're arranging and conducting oftentimes, correct? Orchestrating, yeah. yeah I mean, it depends. I mean, it's, it's you know slight differences, but on the, okay. if the, we use the Frozen Two exam, I was orchestrating. Okay. So, you know, um, Chris definitely knows his music um, and knows what he wants. But I sort of know where the bodies are buried in the inner parts of the the notation because mm. that was my job to, to to make that. You were in there digging and around. Yeah, right, yeah, I, right, I, right. I I was inside, and um, so you know, I what are, things that I find um, fascinating or just that I've learned, you know. So the the entire orchestra can start together, but ending together is different, and notation sort of can convey it, but they need to be listening and you need to sometimes say, okay, no, you know, the brass have to come off a little early here or that phrase should end early so that we start clean on the next one. And a lot of that's detail you either can't put in notation or you don't really know until you get there. Mm. I mean, I can predict a lot of it, but that's the sort of detail that I have to put in, right. you know, right away. Right. Like, well, let's end this phrase here or we need to stop here and pick up again, stuff like that. Um, How but much of this information do you tell the orchestra preemptively? You try not to, not to be overload too them, obvious. Right? Yeah. I mean, so here's the one that I wrestle with every day, though. So the orchestra, I mean, the, the caliber and the skill of the musicians is scary, right? Right. And their, their ears are scary. Right. <laughs> so, you know, but quite often, you know, it's the first time it's being played. No one knows what the harmony is going to be. They mm-hmm. just go for it. Right. So occasionally it's out of tune and, you know, or someone plays a solo and it's not quite in tune yet, you know, because it's the first time they've ever played this thing. They don't know what's what's around them at all, Uh, but they have the most amazing ears. So Mm -hmm. every person in that room knows when something's out of tune. Mm. So sometimes you got people in the booth saying, oh, it's out of tune, it's out of tune, like sort of, you know, telling me to tell the orchestra it's out of tune. It's like... No, no. Let me. They, they yeah. all know, you know. Now, <laughs> yeah. if it's like the fourth take and something's not right because they can't hear something, you know, sometimes mm, we're so different. spread out. And for in, like, for example, in a room like Sony, you know, it doesn't have a lot of. Uh, so Warner Brothers is quite a live room, and it's much easier for everyone to hear each other. Mm. Sony, you set up wide, so the basses are miles away from the French horns, and the back violins are miles from the trumpets. So, it can be hard for them to hear you know, a lot of detail. Sure. So I'll sometimes have to tell them to listen to so-and-so and then we might have to put something in their headphones okay. and all that. And that really helps the intonation, you know, come together. You know, the other thing is we're playing on a click track a lot of the time. So right. that steals, I mean, these people are amazing at it, but it does steal a little bit of focus right? when you've got that. So, Absolutely. you know, if it's out of tune, I won't even say it. I will just say, let's play it without the click and we'll just run it down. And everyone hears something new mm. when that's taken And out. you're running that down off tape. 
Yeah, that's right. just off. You know, just, every other take, good. every other take is recorded. The first take is recorded right. because it might be usable. There might be a little something. Maybe they will find later that there was a click or a pop or right. some technical glitch, so they need to go back and find that beat. You know, from mm. the first version, and that that can happen. Uh, but anyway, so solving the tuning thing is not really telling anyone it's out of tune because they all know it's just sort of getting everyone to listen a little more right. and it always fixes itself. But the one fascinating thing is the timing. So an entire orchestra can play out of time together and not know <laughs> because they sort of play classical rhythm, mm. which is like the William Tell overture. It has, kind of. it has a lag, doesn't it? Well, they can, they can play because they're used to playing on the click, but they'll play like dum, dig 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 dum. Now there might be a synthesizer going dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it. So it's got to be dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. It's got to be a very literal interpretation of the rhythm. You know, like you right. would play along to a delay. You know, if you've got a, sure. a 16th delay going, your yeah. strokes are going to be spot on that delay. That's right. That's You're not right. going to clip yeah. it up. Right. But in, you know, classical music, you, if you've got dum, dig dum you know, that's written dum, da da dum, da da dum, but you delay the last couple of notes into it. Or if you've got three in a row, mm. you speed them up. So you go dig dum, dig dum, dig dum, dig dum. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Sure. Instead yeah, of da da dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. Right. Wow. As a drummer, I mean, I hear it right away. Yeah, you know the difference. Yeah. So, in fact, in my in my my blog, my my website, I, I write out all the rhythms predictively. Like I'm like, even though it's written this rhythm, da da dum da da dum, it's going to be more of a quintuplet. You know, wow. like the first three notes of a quintuplet. Look at that. So, I wrestle with myself. Do I point this out before mm. it's about to happen, knowing it's going to happen? Because or see how they yeah, self- but it's going to happen. I know okay, it's going to happen. You, you, it's what I'm again, saying. Your experience. They, they, yeah, yeah, they yeah, yeah, can yeah, all yeah. hear this, and they can all yeah, cry yeah. and call me on it, and I can say, yeah. "Let's listen to the tape," <laughs> because it happens all the time. Doesn't matter where I am, whether no. I'm in here or London, right. you know, maybe somewhere in Europe, whatever. It's the same thing because they're the training wow. and the way they interpret a rhythm. Wow. Even though you know we've been through this a million times, mm-hmm. whereas you know a rock musician knows. To, to, you know, subdivide right, and right. all of that. You know, they just think of, in, in, in you know, classical musicians think of cells. And Interesting. You know, it's a different kind of way of thinking. That's and, a great it's way It's a different to interpretation it. of the beat. But the magic of it, and this is the magic of the orchestra, is they can play it all perfectly together wrong mm. at the same time. Wow. So they're, they're on. Because, I mean, how else could the orchestra work without having this sort of hive mind kind of extra sense of when you know the conductor just goes up and their hand comes down and then it might be a split second but all the orchestra plays together, together. at the same time they can do that there's this extra sense right of doing it so they can all play wrong together and they're not aware of it and so this is the opposite to, of the tuning issue you have to operate in sheer so, diplomacy so again. Yeah, yeah of course yeah. and so that's yeah. that's why it's kind of not a good move to insult everyone before they play and right. say i know you guys are going to play this rhythm wrong in bar four Ooh. here's how it should go yeah so i don't i could see that but i wrestle in my head every time because i know mm. i could save some time but i don't want to insult everyone i'm sure you've seen people who do come in with their kind of dukes up almost in a, in a it oh yeah, give, I mean, you, have to, you, you have to deal with yeah. you have to deal with stuff, and and it's, and I mean the studio, everyone's pretty happy to be there. But when you go right. in front of a, a you know a legit orchestra in some of these other, you know, especially maybe a pops concert or a mm. movie concert where, you know, some of them, you know, they didn't go to music school and do all that training to mm. play a film score, did they? You know, or a pop song. <laughs> you know, they want to play sure. the, the repertoire. Yeah, right. So uh, that's right. That can be a tougher crowd sometimes. Wow. You know, um, but it's in the good. studio, yeah. no, the attitudes are really good. Yeah. It's just a fact. Like I just right. told you, they're going to play that rhythm wrong. Right. It's, right. It's, that's amazing. It. That's amazing that you you know how to to deal with all that. And again, it goes back to the e word experience. I mean, mm. I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think that's everything no. we do. Any kind of recorded music, yeah. whatever genre or permutation yeah. thereof. Yeah, the experience. Yeah, there's no there's no replacement. For right, that. and and I'm you know. lucky to have it. And that the tricky right. part for someone coming in is well, you can't get the gig unless you've got experience and you can't get yeah. experience because there's no. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there is university <laughs> courses in all of this stuff right. now, but it's like it's nothing Not like the, the real world. No. You know, like standing in front of the string quartet in university conducting class is a big difference to standing in front of seventy people staring you down. That's right. In a studio or, or in a live situation. That's it's right. A, it's a total different it's a big deal. experience. And then yeah. also, you know, in all of these workshops, you know, where you might get a full orchestra, you got 15 minutes. 
no one wastes your time by saying you have to rewrite bar seven. Mm. You know, because you've got you've 15 right. minutes to record your piece and yeah. get your rocks off, you know, get your photos for your Instagram. In and out. <laughs> but but in, in the real world, you know, my job as a conductor is to do that. So like, you know, back to where we we're talking about in the session. So right. we've played it down once. I've given my little little tweaks that I think would do. If sure. there's a note question, they ask me. But most of the time the players can hear if, if someone missed a, a flat in front of a B, you know, somewhere, me or the mm-hmm. copyist, whatever. Uh, they can hear that and they fix that. They won't even ask you. There you go. You know, the good players just know to fix right. that and little things. And if they notice a different articulation, they'll just sort it them amongst themselves. They'll ask. They'll talk you know, in the sections. Usually very quietly. Right. right. But, but they, they sort a lot right. of the issues out that, right. that you don't you have to clearly see if it's a G minor harmony and one they'll hear it. is playing a B natural. They're going to fix that. They're gonna fix and they're not going to waste yeah. my time of course. or anyone's course. time asking yeah. that. And that, yeah. that's what's great about the 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 really successful and great studio musicians is they, Mm -hmm. they sort of know when to ask, when not to ask, when to fix it, you know, not to make a big deal about it. No one wants to make anyone feel bad for making a mistake. That's right. You know, I I had a great, great one. One day I'd written uh, a G flat in the violin two part. Now the instrument stops at G. So (laughs) I had, (laughs) I'd gone too low and the principal second, who's, who's a, you know, a friend of mine, she says, uh, Tim, how would you like bar 27 phrased? So she didn't actually say <laughs> what the problem was. That's no, awesome. no, 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 no. Oh, okay. I thought there was a bit of a smirk in yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, but no, in a fun way. She yeah, didn't yeah, want to yeah. throw me under the bus yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. you <laughs> fucked up and you moron, you went off the end of the instrument. We don't even have that note. Would you like me to drop But it was, tune? it was a way of me looking at the score and going, and then I'm like, oh, as a B flat, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it just changed the note and it was, that's it was awesome. fine. Yeah, that's so, fun. But the good players just know how to handle the situations and not not make a big deal about it. So we'll sort out those sorts of things and then we'll usually play it down again yeah and then you know we usually got it because everyone's like of course amazing so then the composer so in our you know frozen two example would be chris beck yeah will he'll have made notes um and he'll you know give some notes you know he'll give them to me uh and then i mean he's really good he can talk to the orchestra i mean some composers um they don't I mean, they're amazing musicians. They might be rock musicians. They might be from a different world. They're not going to know the exact terms to tell the orchestra Mm -hmm. everything. So it's better that they just tell me and then I translate it. You translate. Follow The Career Musician at Facebook, Instagram, and sign up for The Career Musician newsletter at thecareermusician.com. Being a career musician is more than just gigs and sessions. Are you a career musician? Find out on The Career Musician Podcast, streaming everywhere. Hi, this is Tim Davies, and you're listening to the Career Musician Podcast with my mate, Nomad. Hey, Nomad here. I wanted to let you know that thecareermusician.com is now up and running. Check out thecareermusician.com to sign up for the newsletter, join the Facebook group, and see if you're ready to take the pledge to be a career musician. And the Career Musician Jams is now live on YouTube with two episodes featuring Derek Frank, bassist for Gwen Stefani and Shania Twain, and Latin crooner artist Manuel Romero. Be sure to check out TCM Jams on YouTube. Subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your friends. And remember to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help boost our ratings so that we can get broadcast into more musical ears. This is perfect because one of the questions I like to ask is studio etiquette. So you, you, yeah. you already covered a lot of the studio yeah, etiquette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. And But now here is where it gets a little you know, nitty gritty. Yeah. Let's talk about this. So the pecking order, the composer, you and the composer are working side by side pretty tightly at these sessions. Yeah. I mean, the composer is still the boss. I right. mean, you know, but then he's got the boss, he's got the director and the producer and the above producer him. Standing there, and then depending right? on the movie, you know, it could be the director who's got the top say, or it could be the producer who's got the top say, mm. you know, it's the, all so the different. pecking order well, it could be the, the, the yeah. You know, the best is when the director is the producer. Mm. And, you know, in Frozen's case, it was great because one of the directors was, you know, the producer and the head of, you know, Disney, Disney Animation. Bam. So there was no one else above that had a say. So yeah. those sessions were like some of the smoothest ones we've ever had. Wow. Because it wasn't like it was going to be recorded and then some other producers would listen to it a week later and, you know, throw a grenade at you. 
Now, so so there's less cooks in the kitchen. Which, exactly, keeps, exactly. Keeps yeah. But so when those grenades come, yeah. let's. So <laughs> I'm curious. To, so a producer who makes notes on a score recording, yeah. what what would that be like when, when those grenades are thrown at you? Some examples. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's what, what a little harsh with the grenade be. thing. Yeah, but, no, but but well, you know, the, that Lego Two example I mentioned, where yeah, there sure. was just like two little scenes where, you know, the the, the director and the producers, there was like three of them. You know, they just weren't feeling it yet. You know? Okay. And the, okay. They, and it was like a tricky scene. It's it's usually mm. not the composer's fault. Right. You know, it's usually the composer's job though to fix. A tricky scene. Sometimes. Well, there's so many variables. Yeah, in this chain and sometimes of the command. scenes keep changing too. Ah. So it could have actually been all approved, and then all of a and sudden it's it changed something. in this cut. Now, yeah, there's so right. many reasons right. for things to be changed. Right, and you know, but you know, Which we're there with the orchestra, so we've got to fix it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the composer, you know, uh, sometimes Chris will call me in, and he's he's written some new notes in, and yeah. we'll work it out. I mean, we had one in Frozen where uh, we had to. I had to come into the booth and we listened to it with the directors and with Chris and everything. And, and then we basically worked out all we needed was a suspended cymbal roll. You know, mm. we needed just a bigger moment. And that was a quick fix. You know, it was like, we didn't wow. even have to record the orchestra again. We just had someone play a, a role. A so that was a really easy fix, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one. And, and the director was super happy, wow. you know. Um, but then I've had other ones where we've had to rewrite you know, okay. like whole sections. Right. So you have to go back to the drawing board, so to speak. Well, sort of, yeah, yeah. There was one one movie a few years back where uh, Chris called me in and he's like, okay, you can keep this bit, but the rest has got to be this big, I need a big growing pyramid. Mm -hmm. And it was over like 16 bars or something like that. So I went out and we sent the orchestra on a 10 and I sat at my laptop mm -hmm. and I had the copyist looking over my shoulder to see what I was changing, what I wasn't changing. So we didn't okay. have to redo every part. And then I'm still working away and the orchestra comes back. So there's like 75 of them sitting there now and I'm at my laptop Ooh, yeah. writing out this. Some pressure. What to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, at, with someone looking over my shoulder <laughs> yeah. and everyone waiting. And then, Quality control though, you know, right? Well, he, well, he, was, he, was, uh, he, was, he was making sure yeah. that, you know, I didn't tweak something else by accident, that he knew okay. exactly which parts to recopy, which parts he could just go and write in new notes on and mm. which he had to reprint and all that, you know. So it, it, it was a good thing that he was doing that. Sure. And, uh, you know, so another like 10 minutes go by and I, I finish it yeah. and then I send, send it off to, you know, to his, his computer. And then we had to record two more cues. So okay. we recorded the two more cues. Yeah. And then by that stage, he had recopied the bits that need copying. And, oh, perfect. And then we played the, the new thing and it went down. So you're multitasking, moving things around, just reprioritizing re in the meantime to get the yeah, new material. Yeah, yeah. And it all worked out. Yeah. So yeah. that's a that's a case of like a sort of a grenade, you know, like we sure. weren't predicting that. Yeah. And um, one where I, you know, so it fell on me at that particular time to, mm -hmm. to, to solve it. Uh, but I had to solve it in front of 75 people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that's the sort of the difference between, I guess, being a studio conductor and a legit conductor is, you know, all the notes when you're doing Beethoven or Tchaikovsky are there. You don't go changing them. Right. Uh, it was it was interesting. I did this workshop the other week in Singapore with a bunch of orchestrators and they I flew me that. out. And it was, was this cool. amazing experience. We had three whole sessions with an orchestra, right. um, not our 15 minutes of fame. You know, it was like everyone got plenty of time. And they orchestrated some Ravel and then some of my music and we played it and we workshopped it and we tweaked it and we spoke to the players. It was an amazing opportunity. But the orchestra, you know, I got some of the worst looks I've ever got when I would ask them to change notes because they're not used to changing oh, notes. Oh, wow, you know, look at that. They don't do a lot of recording sessions in Singapore mm. and, you know, they're a fantastic orchestra. Right. But they're just not used to being told to try and experiment things. So in the studio, yeah. we might make five or six different changes to a bar to, to find the right thing. Sure. And they just keep marking it and they just go, sure. And then they smile and then you play it. Mm -hmm. And then you say, sorry, guys, we need to change it again. And they're like, okay, what do you want? You know, and wow. you just keep doing that. And these, I was looking, getting these looks back from, from some of the sections. <laughs> like I was, I was torturing Qu them. Yeah, what are you just, doing? You know, what wasting is Wasting their time, yeah. you know, and it's like, it was just part of it. That's but, you awesome. know, studio musicians are used to They're that. They're accustomed to it. They're yeah. accustomed to it. They've yeah. got their pencil there. It's, it's, it's you know, they, and they know to write, the, you know, it's like torture sometimes with, when you go and work with another orchestra because, well, for me anyway, because they, they sort of don't write everything in. Mm -hmm. So in the studio, the players are really good at writing every little detail in. Even if it doesn't really apply to them, they write it in. 
you sure. know, because you might need to go back and play that the next day or the day after mm, or a month go. later on a movie when they've changed the picture um, and we have to re-record a bit of the cue, you know, you know, get in and out of a sure. section or something like that. And, you know, we're going to look at something that was on someone else's music stand a month earlier. Right. You know, if they didn't mark the, the little tweaks that we'd made properly, it's a mess. Wow. So the studio musicians are just used to marking everything That's and right. they know. So like you're talking etiquette, you know, yeah, you want course. to make sure that the next person that so you, might look at that, even yeah. though they might never get looked at. So they mark everything. It's a, cur- a courtesy, a professional yeah, courtesy and, in a way, yeah. And that's just, a, you know, like a thing that they're used to in the, in the studio. Right. right. Uh, but, yeah, making changes is something we do all the time. That's and, awesome. you know, so, so, you know, back to our little thing. So if everything's gone well, Chris gives his notes and then we play it down a few more times. And if the directors are happy, usually they are because now with the demo process, they've already heard the music, you know, in the, the computer versions and everything. So mm-hmm. it's not like there's any big surprises. Sure. But sometimes they do see something differently or it sounds a little different with the orchestra and they want to make a change and we, we, we make the change, you know, they're right. the boss. Right. And then, and then it's just a matter of playing it a couple of times to get it perfect. Right. You know, because the players each time are learning, you know, one, it might be something technically difficult and it takes them a few times just to get it around mm-hmm. under their fingers. But but also it's just an ensemble thing. Like they're learning yeah. each time they hear, oh, I'm with that person, or if I do this, it'll work better. Right, because they, they just, can't. They don't, they're not looking at the score. No, they're just looking no, at their part. they're just yeah. and it just gets the. It's sort of like the the glue around each note and phrase yeah. gets a little better. The nuances every, every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect and, sense. And uh, but then there's a point, you know, where you go too far and you just keep playing something, and they're like, "Why are we doing this again?" Yeah, why? Yeah. You know, every now and then you get a composer that just wants to keep hearing it for some reason. Eeks, that's not fun. And you know, I'll people start to then ask, and I'll, I'll usually head it off because I'll if we're doing something for the third or the fourth time and there's been nothing wrong with it, mm-hmm. then I'll ask, "What is it we're looking for?" You right. Know? And that assures the musicians that I'm looking out for them. That's right. And I want to know as well because we want to get it right. Because you want to make sure if there is something in particular yeah. that you can correct it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes yeah. and sometimes they don't know and that's fine. It's a feel kind of a it's thing. It's a feel thing. Yeah, yeah, and then sure. just let us know that sure. and, and we'll do it. And then sometimes yeah. I'll just like throw something out that's like not going to be super consequential, yeah. but just enough of a change that everyone feels like we're making something, we're doing okay, it for a yeah. reason. Just, you know, it's like a psychology it's thing. Leadership skills. Yeah, man. it's leadership. You know, you I mean, I, mean, I have lied, yeah. you know. <laughs> you have to know how to steer that I've, ship. <laughs> I've told them that it was a noise and it was no noise or I've told, you know. Right. But, you know, yeah, it's it's a psychology thing. It it's is. It's a leadership That's thing. That's right. Now, like, well, let's talk about that. Done. That's a great segue because I always say that being a career musician really does involve a lot of psychology. Yeah. So and and the the psychology of what let's say a younger person who hasn't had these experiences yet well like what you're saying you don't want to offend somebody you don't want to mm. put somebody on the defensive before you start working right right and, I, and I've fucked up I have insulted people you know and yeah. I've I've pissed people off you yeah know? especially you know you come in there as a new person and you've got yeah. this person that's been doing it forever mm-hmm. but they still need guidance. And it's like, okay, what's the best way to give the guidance? Right. You know, and, you know, I, when I first started, I was a little too direct and I pissed some people off, mm. you know. Um, but then I was lucky enough that enough people, you know, some really good people sort of knew that I didn't mean it. So one, they would stick up for me, you know, to the other That's people. Awesome. But two, they would pull me aside and just say, hey, you know, you're an asshole yeah, you when should you said that. You should tone not, it a different way. Should, yeah. yeah that, and, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'm still uh, me. I'm guilty, you know? yeah, of course. I, but, but, uh, but I was lucky that, you know, those people, you know, spoke to me and talked mm-hmm. to me and, and you can, you know, every, every session, I mean, everything in life is Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you get that's to play the true. game again luckily that's right every time you get back into the studio you go okay what did i do last time that was yeah. stupid or that didn't work and i can't and i'm not going to do it this time that's right and and especially in dealing with players and the psychology and and you know they're they're basically a pack mm-hmm. you know it's like the dog whisperer mm-hmm. they're, they're a pack and you know if you offend one you're going to offend all that's right but if you get one on side you know if you get the important alphas on side then you know that's i mean that's any group situation that is not just an orchestra absolutely the section leaders perhaps that's any group situation yeah Um, that makes perfect sense but yeah there are ways to 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 get things done again or things without 
right. you know, annoying people. And right. so I've, I've learned that one the hard way a few times, yeah. but that's the way, that's life. I think we all have. I've, yeah. I've had plenty of those yeah. as well. So. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and uh, you know, much gratitude to those, uh, you know, angels who look out for us and stick up for us, like you said, especially behind our backs. Well, we yeah. don't even know they're oh, sticking up I've for had us. Situations that's amazing. That <laughs> my career could have gone a total different way. You know, I won't, I won't uh, tell yeah. the story, but yeah, yeah there's been, wow. a, you know, well, One particular it. situation where where someone spoke up for me that That's at the good. right time at the right place yeah and and my whole career could have been different if, there you go if they weren't sitting in there wow so 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 yeah it's 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 good it's real um, it's real so I was lucky that you know I didn't piss everyone off at the, at the very beginning right um, but now now it's you know it's fine you know, yeah I've well you found my way and you know, you are but you are never going to please everyone mm-hmm. you just need them to understand that you mean well and you've got respect and, mm-hmm. and all of that but there's always going to be grumpy ones of course and they know too that you have a lot on your shoulders they know in the position oh, yeah, that yeah, you're yeah. in they understand what's well, they know going I'm being on. sort of you know I got people talking to my head the right. whole time and that's just the right. voices. <laughs> well, I knew that from the moment I met you, but then again, it takes one to know one. I... <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so something else I wanted to ask you about, Tim. Um, I've worked with John Powell on, on a handful of films, mm-hmm. and every time I would always go over to his studio as for overdubs, which I love because mm-hmm. as a guitarist, I get to be the the palette guy. He says, "Oh, do you have something with a Telecaster tone that's twangy? Oh, can you play a classical yeah. pass? Can you play a, a strummy pass on yeah. an acoustic?" Okay. And you're doing the part of it that I love, which is problem solving. So they've got there something, you go. and you're fixing right. it. You're and, gonna, you know, your skills and what you can do better than anyone else. Yes, you know, love is, it is, is is there, and you walk out of there knowing that you contributed and you solved. Made what them a great feel feeling, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what it's all it about. Is. So I agree with you. Yeah. I'm in in my lane. I'm the same mm. way. Um, I really do that. It, there's nothing quite like that. So, but here's my question. So when I go in, I'm overdubbing. Sometimes it's before the orchestra has ever been recorded. Mm-hmm. So I'm pre overdubbing, if you will. Yeah. Right. And then he's going to take those tracks into the orchestra date whenever mm-hmm. that's scheduled. Oftentimes John will have this elaborate mock-up yeah. on logic, yeah. just elaborate. The, at first glance, even a trained ear at first listen, if you were not privy, you would swear, oh yeah. my gosh, that yeah. sounds beautiful. That's an yeah, orchestra. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. how often do composers do those those really detailed mock-ups versus not? Like, okay. So, especially nowadays, because the technology is yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, some people, there used to be people who say they would deliberately do a shitty mock-up so that, you know, the producer would still want to hire an orchestra. <laughs> okay. But yeah. I think that's bullshit. Because everyone tries their best. Because everyone wants to sell it the best. That's you right. You don't want to play a shitty demo. You know, okay. you, everyone yeah. tries to make the best demo they can. Sure. Now, some people have better skills at making demos than others. So like John Powell's amazing at yeah, he it. Takes, it know. takes a lot of manipulation, um, yeah, you know, uh, of the, of the m- n- plugins. Actually, you know, all the yeah. guys I work for are, are really good at it, you know. I mean, yeah. Chris Beck's really good at right. it. Right. Um, Phil Eisler. Oh, of course. You know, they all write very different music, mm-hmm. you know, but, but you know, when, when you hear their demos, it's all there and it's got, you can, you know. Now, depending on the style of music they're writing, though, mm-hmm. um, it's near impossible to make the demo sound really it sounds of like course. to trick someone because there's going to be tells, you know, doing lots of runs and, mm-hmm. you know, dense harmonies and all of that sort of stuff. You know, it just doesn't sound good and you would take so much time. That's right. So, you know, like Chris, you know, his demos are really good. Um, but just because of the nature of the music, there's going to be some tells in there usually that this is not real. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas in, you know, in some of like, you know, the Empire stuff that we do with Phil, where it's just chords coming and going. All right. Big swells. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's easier to mock. It does sound better with the orchestra, but, you know, you could fool a lot more people with that. Right. Right. Um, Because the technology is just not there. Luckily, sure. You know, to, sure. Because, I don't think uh, it ever will be. You can't replace yeah, a human. There's certain things that you can't. You can't do. I mean, you still can't get a great saxophone no. sample, or in my opinion, you can't get a great guitar sample no. unless you're actually just taking a recording of a guitar yeah. and chopping it up and using yeah. it for something. Yeah. But that, that again, the time consumption there is well. That's it's the time. So, you know, yeah. so yeah. you know these they've got to get it. They're going to always do the best they can right. with the time they've got and the tools they've got. Sure. You know. Sure. Um, you know, I've worked with composers whose demos sound awesome, but they don't sound real at all. Mm. 
you know, different sort of, they're more sound designy. Yeah. And, you know, my job is to try and work out how to, you know, do that with the orchestra. Right. It's a different sort of puzzle to solve. But, Very you different. know, equally as rewarding because I'm still, you know, fixing something. Which nowadays the sound designy vibe is really popular. We're right. Getting a yeah. lot of... And, and so, in, yeah. so I need to know a lot about the instruments, a lot about mm -hmm. how to write that stuff, you know, right. and make those noises, Yeah. you know. And, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's another you know. problem solver there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. you know, I mean, I'm I I love that I'm you know, one day I can be working on a jazz thing uh -huh. or an arrangement for yes. for an orchestra, then I'm orchestrating some sort of standard or you know, like some fantasy mm -hmm. cue. And then the next thing I'm, you know, working on some video game with a lot of sound designy elements where I'm making the orchestra twist in on itself and contort right. and, and do all of these crazy things. I, I love that too. The variety yeah, so is beautiful. That, and that's what, yeah, if I had to do the same job every day, I wouldn't survive. I know, right? Yeah. So having that variety, you know, <laughs> is, is, you know, I... I I like it. One of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast, because right. I like just talking to yeah, other people yeah, yeah. about what we do, you mm -hmm. know, and it keeps it fresh. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Th excellent. Man, this has been so great. I don't want to keep too much of your time. So real quick, mm -hmm. uh, you already mentioned a handful of them. And of course, it's all available online. Some of your credits, uh, Frozen 2, the Lego movie. Uh, go down the lit uh, Ant-Man, Ant Ant-Man Ant -Man movies. I mean, I mean, then it's the, you know, arranging and stuff. Um, I just worked on the Oscars. But that's right. You just did the Oscars. Yeah, Yesterday yeah. I saw a post. Oh, yeah, it was today, one of yeah. several, but, you know. Of course, yeah. That's, that's always great to work on that. Incredible. Like my second year doing that. I uh, work on Empire each week. Empire, TV show. Right. Um, you know, the other thing I've been doing a lot of now is conducting live uh, mm. movies. So I was just in Taiwan last week. We did Ratatouille. That's right. But I saw I've, that. You know, I've done like Beating the Beast and Little Mermaid and Frozen. So, Incredible. I mean, it's like a different sort of set of skills, but sort of related. Sure, sure. But that's fun. It gets me all around the world. It gets you traveling a little bit. Yeah, traveling. How do you, do you like traveling? Yeah, yeah. It's what, I like it. What are some tour essentials for you? What do you have to have when you go? You're like, man, uh, well, I, I can't mean, live I, without. I, I take a big monitor in my suitcase. <laughs> you do? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Until recently, I was taking a 28-inch monitor in my big suitcase. But wow. on my last trip last year, my, my yeah. second last trip, it basically just exploded my suitcase oh, after too much. Man. So I, I bought... I splurged and I bought one of those really nice aluminium suitcases. Oh, the yes. medium size. Love those. And then a 23-inch high-res monitor. So it can actually fit as much as the 28. Perfect. It's a little smaller. It's like a retina display, you know. Yeah, sure. And that fits perfectly in the suitcase. Nice. So I, yeah. I, I lug that and I lug basically an entire mini studio around with me wherever I travel to mm. so that I can work. Yeah. I can orchestrate. Or if I'm saying to the guys, okay, I'm off having fun you guys have got to like pick up the slack this week sure. but i still have to check all of their work well mm -hmm. i like to mm -hmm. and uh so you know doing that on a laptop's like not fun it's at tough all. it's all cramped yeah, yeah and it's awful whereas you know so i might not spend you know a ton of time in my hotel room working now mm -hmm. uh that half an hour that i can spend with a big monitor and proof 10 things it's way better than like an hour and a half or yeah. two hours on a laptop screen. Yeah, sure. You know, dying Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and screaming at it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. switching windows to, to like write oh. notes and all that sort of stuff. So right. so that's, you know, that's for me and my little Bose head. Not Bose. Yeah, the Bose, are, I've got the Bose noise cancelling, the ones that sit in your ears, the not earbuds. the ones over oh, your yeah. ears, yeah, the yeah. earbuds. Because that's then you nice. can lie on a pillow still or you can pull one out. And yeah, you don't get you your sleep. head crushed by this giant <laughs> headphone. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's, that's awesome. That's my, that's my travel essential. Yeah, that's a nice little and, unique Oh, and kit. then the, the, um, the emergency sandwich. So Oh, I like that. Yeah, so wherever you travel to, yeah. Um, you know, I try to sleep right away. The minute I get on the plane, okay. I'll try and go to sleep. And then Smart. wait, never, never, never be dictated by the meals on a plane, you know, like, you, right. you, cause it's like, you got to wait an hour and a half and then yeah. you have this big meal yeah. and it's like silly. Yeah. Go to sleep. Yeah. Then they'll either keep the meal or they mm -hmm. often have like a midnight snack kind of sure. thing. And, and so you have that in the middle yeah. and then you can just chill, you know, maybe nap a bit more. The rest, yeah. But then you know, it doesn't matter how much you drink or party on the first night, yeah. you're going to wake up at three or four in the morning and breakfast <laughs> is not until seven. Oh, it's so true. So you need the emergency sandwich. That is brilliant. So in, in like London, it's an emergency sandwich. Yeah. But in Asia, they have, in, uh, in Taiwan, they have these amazing sort of like, it's like a rice 
thing with like meat in the middle. Yeah. It's like a triangle yeah, and it has seaweed. It's wrapped in seaweed. Yeah. You get them at 7 Eleven there. Yes. And 7 Eleven in, in Taiwan is not like 7 Eleven here. It's totally different. <laughs> totally different thing. Yeah. But so these snacks, they're amazing. And so yeah, you get like one about. or two of them, you just leave them there. And just... when you need them on that first night, yeah, you got it, and they last a good little while in oh, the fine. bag. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, fine. so I that's, that's I guess that's my three or four little travel. That is awesome. Travel that's, tips. <laughs> yeah, that's a great travel kit. That's a unique mm. one, man. Mm -hmm. All right, so wrapping things up, M memorable moments, most ridiculous thing that happened on a gig or a session, perhaps mm. something funny or, you know. Cool, quirky? Um, most ridiculous thing. Well, I don't know if it's the most ridiculous, but we've had a couple of, you know, stops at sessions for various things. You know, we had a, a cricket issue at Fox one time where wow. they kept making noise and we couldn't record. How they the were in the ducting at the back, you know. Oh. Um, and then another time we were at Warner Brothers just recently doing, what were we doing? I think we were doing, uh, it was an Olaf Frozen short thing. Right. It was like a month ago mm -hmm. and uh, fire alarm went off oh. and I was lucky enough that I had my little earbuds because I conduct with just my little earbuds and mm -hmm. they go right in, but there was enough to take the edge off. Mm. But I saw the lights flashing and you, I heard it because it's so loud, sure. but the poor players, the you know, I mean, one, they've all got this sensitive hearing right. and they, you know, they're only wearing one ear with the headphones. Oh, right. So it just knocked them out there. The looks on the faces, oh. you know, it was awful. And we all, we just all went out and, you know, they packed up. The string players all grabbed their instruments. They're just and, done. That was yeah, it for the day? The trombones didn't take their trombones, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the strings are like, I'm out of here. The strings all took their, their really expensive yeah, instruments. Yeah, yeah, And then we, we were outside for an hour or hour and a half, hour or something like that. Really? Yeah. Oh, it was an hour. Yeah, it was just an hour. And, and then you went back in, though. We went back in because okay. they had to uh, – it was a faulty sensor in a duct, mm. so there wasn't anything, but – we weren't allowed to go back until they had fixed the sensor mm. for fire code sure. things. Have so we had to stand aside. It. it was getting cold and everything, yeah. you know. So, huh. so that was – and another time we were at Capitol and there was like a circuit. I don't even know what caused the noise, but it was some sort of <clears throat> like little oh, ticky man. thing in a wall. And we couldn't <sighs> work out what it was. And we ended up – everyone left the room. And then the engineer was sort of walking around listening, trying to find it. And we found it in a wall and it was not going to wow. go away. It was like some sort of, you know, short yeah. that was causing the noise. Oh, geez. So we had to cancel that session. I mean, everyone got paid. Yeah. And they rebooked it. And then they, and they rebooked it in another studio for the Interesting, next man. Interesting. So, you know. There's... You never know what's going to happen. You have to be ready to go with the flow, right? Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Take the best part of it is just honestly, you know, just conducting and hearing something for the first time, you know, yeah. whether it's one of the shows like we did or, or whether it's, you know, hearing that the music for Frozen, mm. you know, which was like amazing. And, and wow. you know, this time when we did Frozen 1, we didn't know anything about what it was like. It was just a movie with, yeah. you know, icicles everywhere. <laughs> and then... Um, it was you know, more than that, apparently. Well, yeah. yeah. But we didn't know it at <laughs> of the time. Course. At the time, you don't but know. But so yeah. going back to do Frozen 2... Now you're aware. We knew what it was going to be. Mm. And, you know, so everyone, you know, you know, everyone was like really on it. Sure. And knew that they wanted to do, you know, the best. So the score was really awesome. So just playing that for the first time. That's awesome. You know, it was, was great knowing what it was, was wow. going to be. But my one sort of studio sort of more personal moment was when we did the first new Muppets movie mm. and we did Rainbow Connection. Okay. Which is just like one of my favorite songs. Yeah. And so just to be there... And then hear that kind of surreal start up, yeah. and then hear hear you know hear Kermit you know it was just like That's oh cool. my god you know I'm like here I mean you know the first piece I played in junior band was the Muppet Show theme you know oh, wow. so to work on then the Muppets movies were, were really cool but That's but I cool. just remember like you know getting not totally emotional but some goosebumps you know doing when you get to the bridge and sure. that of the of, of the Rainbow Connection. That's awesome, dude. And then another time when I got, actually got to meet Paul Williams and uh, and tell him that story because we oh, worked right. we worked on a movie together a couple of years later and wow. I saw him going into the same building. I'm like, that can't be that guy. Mm. And then he turned up at, in the same meeting that I was going to. That's cool. And, and he was really cool. I mean, you know, awesome. he got a kick out of me telling him that story. Sure, sure. And, uh, 
and yeah, super super cool. It's great. It's great when you meet someone that you've uh, looked up to, and they uh, they come up to the and they're gracious. Yeah, yeah, but they come yeah. up to the, the you know you don't yeah. walk away with a, a lower opinion <laughs> of them. Get your head, <laughs> which can happen. You know, it's happened you, to me <laughs> when you meet someone it's that you've just idolized <laughs> yes. and they're a, a complete idiot. <laughs> oh, one of my heroes. It happened. To me. So I know <laughs> we should stop now. We should stop. Yeah, enough said. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. so final words of wisdom. Somebody who mm. wants to somebody who just like you who had that bug that said you know what i enjoy composing i enjoy playing but i really want to be an arranger an orchestrator conductor mm -hmm. any words of wisdom do it you know like in these days like people often ask me like how do i get in and it's like just do it you know do just some arrangements start doing it you know find a, a song that doesn't have much going on in it like maybe it's just someone doing piano and vocal mm -hmm. add an orchestra to it and put it on youtube i mean you might get told to take it down but it might last for a while it's someone the artist might hear it that's right call it up that shit happens that's right you know i mean well, you and i talked about this a couple of weeks ago yeah, yeah we yeah, did yeah. talk about i it. asked you i said <laughs> i want to compose for tv how yeah. do i do it you said just do it <laughs> write some music and put I love it online it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. amazing the number of stories that people get discovered like that so that's like right. i mean i'm lucky you know like the phone rings and i you know, I don't have time to do my right. own little shit at the moment. But you've built it. Up. But but if I had downtime, mm -hmm. that's what I'd be doing. You know, yeah. I okay. I'd right. be just, you know, when I did the, uh, I need to put it online. But when I did the um, the Nas stuff for the first time, I had to do demos mm -hmm. and send it to to him. And for um, for New York State of Mind, you know, I just. Um, got the actual track and, you know, put my orchestra over that track okay. you know, and turn it down a little bit. Sure. So you could hear what's going on. But for um, uh, Life's a Bitch, uh, I found the isolated vocal online. Oh, yeah. You got the acapellas. Yeah. Beautiful. So I oh, could do my orchestra cool. with him. And I actually, yeah. you know... You know, it, it was one time when I went too far, actually, because okay. I, I I totally had him rapping over just the piano lush thing and all sorts of stuff, you know, uh -huh. and I'd sent it off uh -oh. <laughs> and, and didn't hear back. So okay. we show up yeah. and, you know, he hadn't listened to it, you know, oh, okay. and he gets there and he's like, oh, what's going on here? What's so happening? it was the one time when I did have to change it because I had okay. to, pretty much the first verse was like that. After that, it went to the original. So I just, mm. we just had to paste back. Sure. Some stuff, but I did sure. have to do some emergency yeah. surgery on that one just to make him feel comfortable. That's so, cool. But, again, but you know, ready yeah, for anything. I, I, I survived. You know, yeah, you have to try these things, and and I thought he'd listen to it. Ah, and he knew, okay. but he he hadn't, okay. or he, or he hadn't noticed that he had yeah. to rap over a piano. Right. Um, but I've got that, so I need to just you know post it one day. You should, you know, yeah, or get get one of your uh, yeah. assistants or somebody to do it because that would be really great. Yeah. So anyway, but just just stuff like that. I, you just got to do do stuff because you know when you do get the gig, you're going to be thrown in on the deep end of something mm -hmm. that you might not have done. That's right. Um, but so the more you can can do beforehand but right. there's no excuse now for not not doing it not doing it you can you can call people that will play you can put if you want to be a jazz guy you can put together your own big band i mean i did it when i first got to town i just right. you know met a few people asked them for names and you know Started within three it. days of calling i had my band you know incredible. and all of them still play with me now incredible um and you know you've everyone's got their laptop now is you know right. Garage band and whatever or yeah. logic, yeah. you can write shit Absolutely. and you can post that to YouTube or SoundCloud and you never and know. Just, I mean, there's no excuse. That's right. I love that. So, there's no excuse. Just do yeah. it. Yeah. And just do something unique. I mean, yeah. the, there's so many people that have been discovered by doing a, a cover. Yeah. Whether it's a just like playing over the top. You know, like right. drum drum like covers or bass covers, yeah. like actually just, literally playing, just over the top. playing over the top of the There's song. There's nothing yeah. creative <laughs> about right. it at all. They are just playing over the top <laughs> of it. Right. You know, no? but but better still, you know, add something to something that wasn't there. Yeah, you're and right. Then put that out there. You're right. You know, you can either do your own complete new vocal. Or you, there is plenty of stuff out there that you know is just a piano and a vocal, and That's right. add add shit to it. I love see it. See where that takes you. I love it. Yeah. That's great advice. I'm going to do some now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hey, yeah. before you go, rapid mm -hmm. fire, real quick. Favorite mm -hmm. food and or libation? Favorite food would be curry. Curry. Definitely. Red, brown. Uh, Indian. Yellow, Indian. Indian. Okay. 
it could be sort of anything, either a Any, korma a or a vindaloo, okay. you know, nice. depending on how I want spicy or not so spicy. But nice. basically anything with rice as well. Like that's why I love going to Asia, you know. That's awesome. Uh, libation, uh, champ- champagne. Champagne. Yeah, I generally drink sparkling wow. wine. There's always a couple of bottles in the fridge. Nice. Other than that, the next would be like a nice lager. Okay. None of this IPA crap. Yeah. You gotta be able to, gotta be <laughs> I'm able to, not an IPA. You gotta guy, be able yeah. to see through it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I like that. I like it. Yeah. And uh, you don't really have free time aside from spending it here at the Career Musician Podcast. Mm-hmm. How do you spend your free time? The little bit you do have. Oh, gosh. What do I do? I watch uh, YouTube videos of lock picking. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> What's the last song you listened to that you weren't working on? The last song? Yeah. Uh, I was listening to, on the way here, Woman in Chains, uh, Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears. Yeah. Favorite TV show that, again, you haven't been working on, oh, if you have one. God, favorite TV show. I mean, I, uh, Ray Donovan. Oh, I love that one, too. Yeah. Excellent. Shopping, online or brick and mortar? Bit of both. Okay. But I, 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 I never go to a brick and mortar and then buy it online. If I go there, I'll buy it from the brick and mortar. I feel bad. Yeah, I, I concur. Perfect. And what would you do if you weren't a professional musician, a.k.a. the career musician Tim Davies? I would probably have gone into either computers. Mm. Like that was my sort of second best subject was programming. And I, I love problem solving and solving that. Right. Like my, my rig, I have, you know, hundreds of macros programmed, anything I can automate, you know, and I'll be on the craziest deadline ever. And if I have an idea for some automation, I'll stop and program it. Wow. That's neat. So I have have a just I like that. So a, real, a technical I, mind. Yeah, I probably would have done. It. I, I don't know if I would have been any good, but okay, you know. <laughs> but an engineer that, that, of some sort. Yeah, I don't know if I would have made it into engineering so much because you know I was not good at the maths. But right. whatever, I like I like problem solving and, and coming up with with that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know, it's beautiful. And your social handles, we can find you. Um, it's, uh, Tim Davis 72 on Instagram, debriefed on, uh, Twitter. And then my website is Tim music or T I music.net. Perfect. But we'll you can have just all Google those my here. name and it'll all come up. Yeah, yeah. And we'll have them listed in the cool. episode. Tim, you have been an awesome guest. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I love the fact that you were just right around the corner at Warner brothers last night recording yeah. And now you're here doing this little podcast. So I appreciate you with all humility. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you for having me. All right, man. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man. Writing the songs in this one man band. A nomad. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.